<laughs> and thank you all for coming. I know as lockdown's easing and everybody's going off and getting busy, um, it's very good of you to come <laughs> to come and see, listen to what I've got to say. I, I appreciate it enormously. Um, now, this was... Um, where does this come from? Well, I'm hoping I can illustrate by the end what, where, where the title came from. Um, it stems from actually a work over a few years that I've been doing, uh, connected mainly with two things. First of all, it's my person, an ex it's a sort of exploration and investigation um, into um, my personal journey, really connected with what you can see just over to my side here, my cello. Um, I've been having lessons again uh, as an adult with my cello. Um, I had a, you know, like so many of us, I, I was offered, invited to take up an instrument at school. So I took up the cello, had sort of as an adult, as a young adult, having a family, I put it all down, gathered so much dust, I'd forgotten it was there. And then uh, as a young ret uh, retiree, because I did retire, I retired, took early retirement, I took up lessons again. And um, it's the best thing I ever did. Um, I have a very venerable teacher who's in the Halle. I live in Bakewell in Derbyshire. So we, I go up to the Bridgewater quite a lot. And uh, oh, now I've lost everything. There we are. Um, and uh, she's uh, a working professional. And what she hasn't learned from fantastic teachers, she's worked out herself. And every time I go there, it's a lesson of not only therapy, but investigation into practice, because I'm, I, it is my theory, really. I, I've met um, professional mountain climbers as well. Anybody who's master of a sort of craft in that way, they have to climb the rungs of working with sort of words and terms that we commonly use in practice. They kind of instinctively know those and actually consciously know those according to the language and the form formulas that they come up for working with their craft um, and that for me was very very interesting and uh, that we understand each other we we talk in the same language we, we do uh, we're talking the same language my uh, the other side of it was walkings it walks in nature especially over lockdown I'm fortunate to live in the country and I've been out walking more or less every day and uh, that sort of inspired an investigation and in a way that I hope I'm going to become clear a little bit later on. My motivation in doing in, in this, in doing what I'm doing and thinking about the cello and the, was actually to deepen meditation practice. I, I am I respond to the way, for example, Paul Dennison talks about fine material sphere and working with uh, jhana. And when we go to the settling, in other words, and uh, trying to touch whatever it is, that fine material sphere, and trying to develop discernment or develop understanding connected with the practice um, and seeing if there's ways in daily life that might complement that. Um, the other thing that's always struck me about the note, uh, music um, is when you've been to a good concert, I always find that as, a, as one of the senses of, of which we, we've got the six, haven't we, because we call mind a sense in, in Buddhism as well, it's very tangible, uh, almost more tangible than a lot of them because we use it so much and it's the fleetingness of it. If life is, is but fleeting, as whatever they say, sound is. Good concert. What have you got to show for it at the end of it? You've got a, a gramophone, oh, now I'm showing me age, recording that's, um, you know, doesn't quite the same as the live, life version of going to a live concert. And you've got sense impressions, which may be a bit of bodily, a bodily comfort, uh, a sense of happiness connected with the, the, the hearing, the concert. Um, and then a few days later, it might hang around if you're lucky. It was a really good one. It'll hang around for the rest of your life. But um, it's the fleetingness of it, which, in which was 
intriguing to me. Now, there are sort of my investigations over the years and over the months over lockdown um, have taken a variety of routes. One, as I've already explained, the longer term one, the cello. And being in an orchestra, I joined an orchestra. I put myself into under pressure, really, <laughs> being part of a little section that <laughs> is quite difficult keeping up with the notes sort of thing. Um, uh, then... Uh, the, then also reading, and um, uh, that's taken a variety of paths. I was alerted in particular to one book, which if you haven't read, it's a fantastic read. It's The Wings to Awakening, to Nisero Bhikkhu. And I, that I was alerted to the sort of musical implications in this book. And when I really read it, it's wonderful. He, he It's implicit. He used words um, such as, he connects um the uh, he can he makes analogies in, um, to the five faculties uh, as a way of developing. As we know, they're they're the ones we use to developing skill in any kind of skill that we develop, and that can work very nicely in daily life as well as in practice, can't it? Um, he connects the law of the seven, the bojangas, in other words, because this book um, it, it is, is about that, isn't it? To the ancient pre-Buddhist laws connected with. Um, the scale or octave theory of classical Indian music, which I'm more about that a little bit later, but um, and that's very intriguing as well. Um, and he uses then it's the words he uses. He uses his book is about the Bodhipakya Dhammas, the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, and his the, the theme of his book is that, and that's one of the words he uses. He uses words like tuning and attuning. He looks like he uses words like harmonizing. He uses words like tonic, as in the tonic note of the scale of seven and eight, uh, um, in, in, uh, implicitly in the scale, isn't there? Um, so these are very intriguing and finding parallels. Uh, he, he talks about it directly, linking it with practice. And his translations are very musical. Um, so coming to the, the title then, um, the what I wanted to look at, I'm looking first of all at the word music. I'm just reading in front of me a dictionary definition, vocal or instrumental sounds or both combined in such a way as to produce beauty of form, harmony and expression of emotion. Well, already it, we've got a sort of good analogy for practice, haven't we? But harmony on one level, harmony on another. We've got sort of maybe there are correspondences. These are all questions. And as it's an investigation, I couldn't really feel I could put a sentence without a question mark at the end of it. <laughs> so there are questions for everybody, really. Um, and also, um, for me, when I listen to sound and I've been listening to the effect of lockdown, it's very obvious over the last year when the cars disappeared and the motorbike we got a lot of motorbikes around Bakewell and Derbyshire Dales um the the bird songs it was very loud at first and then you know they say on the radio don't they they're singing more softly because they don't have to compete with all the sounds of the cars and you get a chance to listen and I to me it's all part of the world of music and I wanted to try and find a way of expressing that in this talk really the principle that it's not what you're listening to but how how you're listening to it really <laughs> um so that was the music side of it the other side was I put summer to meditation and I don't know why I've never done this but I looked at the word summer now um Tanisaro Bhikkhu mentions summer and again, linking it to ancient um, Indian contexts. And I thought, I'm going to look this up. This, If this is, first of all, go to my dictionary, try and find, is it linked to the word samata, sama? And I could see no reason why not. Um, and, you know, when I went to, uh, you know, I'm sure if I've got this wrong, I'd be very pleased. Any facts that I come up with that are wrong, please tell me if it is wrong at the end. But it seemed to me there was a link. Uh, and when I looked into it, um, in, in ancient pre-Buddhist India, there were uh, the, the great traditions of performing arts in, for example, theatre, dance, drama, music. Um, and there is a, a great text that, that 
outlines the rules, the rules for classical Indian dance, the rules for classical Indian music. And as we know, there's a lot of uh, references in some of the suttas, uh, the, the Sona Sutta and various that have been mentioned. And I, I also wanted to say how great all the talks are. And there's one, there was a new Samatra at Home newsletter article uh, after Richard's lovely one on music that uh, he that mentions some of these suttas as well. So there are a lot of great suttas actually referring to sort of music implicit in them. Um, and what I found is um, that uh, when I looked into this, there was, a, I, you know, I found on, on um, the internet this text and it had references to how Samma is employed in music in ancient, in, in the way they talked about it in these ancient traditions in music. And in all, but in all contexts, it had the meaning of evenness, quiet, calm, natural. Now, Francis mentioned natural last week, in tune with the laws of nature. Um, Samma, is, it talks about, is essentially a mode of measuring time in music. And it gives advice specifically on singing, sing evenly. Advice on playing a note. The note repeats itself in the same pitch, the level, isn't it, to the height of what we're seeing, and in equal parts. Interestingly, it says that the rules play, used in playing drums, Sama here is a quick tempo. Well, I know I'm in danger of stretching illusions, but it has always been in the back of my mind when we talk about longest accounting or longer of counting and we, we work with the breath that there is an interesting identity that goes on of length with speed sometimes, and we sometimes find a slow breath. It's not necessarily slow, is it? I mean, it's actually, uh, it's, and it made me think that actually, for some of us, we know that our breath changes, and sometimes it may be slow, but sometimes it may be fast, and sometimes we may be, need it to be fast. So I thought that was sort of quite interesting. Um, and I began to think, well, you know, could there be a parallel in practice? So finding the natural flow of the breath uh, in a natural, even, regular tempo or pulse. Um, you know, so it sounds awfully like um, a way of describing equanimity to me, a way of, dis of uh, finding, allowing the mind to settle. So I'm going to come back to that in a bit because it seemed to me to work with that word samma because the more I thought about it, I thought, my goodness, Rose, this is the root of our meditation practice. It's the key. We've got it in the title of our organisation. So I've never really thought of looking at this word into more depth about actually etymologically, what is it talking about? And so I would pose that to you as a first point for consideration, what, what, whether that is meaningful or not really pertinent, up to, up to you, up to everybody. It's a uh, interesting point to consider at any rate, at least. What I'd like, and then, so now going back to notions of music and walking, playing the cello, and I thought to myself, what? have I got in common with all of these? And of course, the sense that is the commonality is the ear, because if I play something on this, I've got to hear it, or at least maybe I'd, I've got to feel it. I can feel it, but I'm still at some level hearing it is my supposition, because all sorts of interesting questions are coming up for me by this time about which comes first, hearing or listening. Do you have to, li you have to listen? If you're lucky, you hear. But they seem to be there. We relate them both to the ear. You know, it is the last feature to go, as was has been mentioned in another uh, previously uh, before we die. Uh, but if you, you can listen, there's something about an active and uh, receptive faculty about that that's rather interesting. So I thought, OK, I'm going to share screen now. I'm going to go into worlds because by now I'm also thinking in terms of worlds. So I'd like to invite you on a little world. Please tell me if this is all wrong afterwards, because this is facts. I'm not, you know, I'm, I've had to work with this to make sure I can, uh, I really understand what I'm talking about here. So I am going to just share screen, if I may. 
So here we are. Here's your ear. Basically, there's not a lot of it. It's all an act of faith, really, isn't it? Because the only thing we can actually see is the thing clapping around on the outside. It's marvellous. We've got two of them. We've been given them by birth, birthright. We've got the pinner directing sound waves into the ear, the ear canal. I'm going to read what it says underneath. Uh, the human ear has three main parts, the outer, the middle, the inner ear. The outer ear is like a funnel collecting sounds from the air. It leads to a tube, the ear canal, which ends in a flexible circular eardrum. Sounds make the eardrum vibrate, and this in turn makes the three small bones in the middle ear vibrate too. Now I put underneath hammer, anvil, and stirrup. So that bit in the middle where you see middle ear, that malleus, incus, and stapes, I think that's what that is. Um, the bones pass the sound vibrations to the cochlea in the inner ear. Now look at the shape of that little beauty. Lovely, isn't it? Where they are changed into nerve signals. There's your nerve up, up, up above your cochlea that take it off into the brain. So there we have it. That's the instrument that is um, what the anatomy tells us we've got. Now, I want to take you through some worlds and I'm suggesting I'm going to go through them fairly speedily, but I'm trying to just go through them so that they are clear to you. So I'm taking you to, um, as we go through them. But I'm doing this because I want to give a sense, a sense impression, really. I'm not so worried about really main, retaining the detail about it. It's more to offer um, a sense impression because I found that the, my explorations, well, I, I just wanted to read about it so that I could go out on a walk this afternoon, for example, and what do I remember about what I've heard about the ear? Um, if it comes up, if it, it comes up, if nothing comes up, then it doesn't. And I was kind of, um, I would offer these in that kind of spirit, really. So there's your ear. Now, this is one world. I'm taking you into another world now. And I'm taking you into, um, before, in fact, um, I'm also going to take you into neuroscience world, which I'll, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll in fact, I'll come back to the neuroscience world and we'll do this. I'm taking you into an Abhidhamma world now. Uh, so the Abhidhamma talks about, as we've already said, um, the six senses, the five senses and ideation. And it uh, says that um, what, what are the states that are of the self, the sphere of the five senses and ideation, what are the senses that are external? The spheres are the five objects of sense and of ideation. Uh, so we've got sense base, we've got sense object, object of sense. So let's just look at that a little more. Uh, what is that form, which is the sphere of hearing, the ear, that is to say the sentient organ. So that's what we've been looking at. Now, interestingly, before we go any further, there is an interesting little description of in the footnote about what the sentient organ is, which is slightly different to the one that we've just been looking at. It's situated within the cavity of the aggregate organism of the ear. It's well furnished with fine reddish hairs and is in the shape of a little finger stall, like you put on your finger when you've hurt it. So that's that. It's derived from the four great phenomena, so the elements. It forms part of the nature of the self. It's invisible. It's reacting. So by reacting, well, it's reacting, but it's also it's sensitive. It's sensitive and it's ready to react at any moment. So by which ear, invisible and reacting, one has heard, hears, will or may hear a sound that is invisible and impinging. I'm just going to read it through and then I'll, I'll, I'll interpret if I may. Against which ear, invisible and reacting, sound that is invisible and impinging, has impinged, impinges, will or may impinge. Which ear, invisible and reacting, has impinged, impinges, will or may impinge on sound that is invisible and impinging? What on earth does that mean? Basically, if I may bring us to my interpretation of it, you've got this organism, this sense base, that 
there is a process that is a two-way process. It's one of action and one of reaction. That there is, it is, uh, it is um, impingeable on, and as well as impinging. So the uh, against the ear, the sound impinges against the ear, but the ear also impinges against the sound. So there's a very clearly a, 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 a sense of. Uh, an active process here. Now, interestingly, and in what we just looked at with the ear, they do say that that is an active process too. And if I may quote the, the neuroscience um, description of this, there's a lovely neuroscience description. In that picture we just looked at where we talked about the, there was the tympanic membrane and the, ha the hammer and the anvil. We've got a, a pretty good rhythm section of a band. I'm going to make it the full jazz band by adding a piano because the neuroscience po point of view, uh, one, one that I read, which I thought was marvellous, uh, there was a Professor von Helmholtz from the 19th century, a physician, who said that that cochlea, that beautiful snail-shaped spiral that we saw, um, is um, an inverse piano. And this, he said, and he, he, apparently he's proven to be true, that uh, he says that if the, harmo if the notes of, an, of a piano come together to form a harmonious whole, what the ear does is do that the other way around. So it takes the harmonious whole and separates it out into individual bits. And along that cochlea, that spiral, there are 16,000 fine hairs, each with a, a, a receptor at a frequency now this uh, of 0.1%. And if I tell you that he made a, an analogy a note on the piano, one to the next one, is 6%. Now, I'm going to play it for you. Can you hear it? I don't know whether you can hear that. I'll put, it, I'll put this up to master volume loud. I'll do it. That's 6%. We've got 16,000 of them. The interval is 0.1%. That's how tuned we are to sound and to hearing. That's what we've got in here. Now, sadly for us, as, especially as we get older, they some of them stop functioning because the hair cells die. I think this chap's job, he was trying to look into uh, finding ways of uh, overcoming that. But uh, that's another story. Um, so we have this wonderful mechanism. And the cochlea is a acts as, a, 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 as an amplification mechanism. In this sense, of the senses, it is completely different to the other senses. None of them, you, if you smell something, for example, it doesn't amplify in scent. Uh, if you uh, see something, you're not actually, if you see light, it's not going to suddenly become even more dazzling than it, than it already is. But in the ear, that's what happens. That in, that's what happens. Um, so and so they and they call that body where of where sound resonates a resonator. And if I now go back slightly to physics, and we've got this sense base, we've mentioned this sense object on this page. I'm going to just take it out to the world of sense objects in the way that physics might put it. And physics says to us. Yeah, um, all things, all items have their own sound based on their particular characteristics, which are connected in particular with density, with volume. But this is the amazing, I found this the amazing thing about this, reading about this and listening about this BBC TV programs, terrific. Um, they each, in, what, in any sound that you're hearing, it's telling you everything you need to hear about the object. So it's, that's worth thinking about. Now, I'm not talking about me particularly wanting to 
uh, attain divine hearing or anything like that. But I, by now, I just want to open up my sense of hearing to give myself the possibility of hearing something when I go out walking that maybe I'm not at the moment. So I'll just perhaps come back to that later. But so anyway, going back to this page that is in front of you, and we're going back to Abhidharma world. So we've been to a neuroscience world. We've been to a bit of a physics world. I'm bringing you back to a bit of a neuroscience, uh, an Abhidharma world, all right? So we have this sense base. And now what we have to understand is that Abhidhamma works at, we know, a minuscule level. Most of the sounds that we hear, we, do, we don't hear, we're not aware of. They're sort of invisible. But there is that active choosing progress. Now, in, in anatomy, that's the amplification, that's the cochlea. And it says that even in biology, that that is an active process. So we, at some level, we're choosing what we listen to. So does Abhidhamma. Uh, depending on which year, in consequence of a sound, there has arisen, arises, will or may arise, auditory contact. I'm going to go on. At some level, there is choice in this. Depending on which year, having a sound as its object, so we're now into the world of sound object with the Abhidhamma, there has arisen, arises, will or may arise, born of that auditory contact, feeling, perception, thinking, auditory cognition at that point, we're beginning to recognize what we're hearing. And at that point, that, that uh, at cochlea, where that, that um, uh, nerve ending, uh, you know, it'll take off, carry us off into the brain. It's been working at any rate, but it's, we, it's something's becoming conscious in our mind of what we're listening to. And that's the other wonderful thing that when I was reading about this, I thought, you know, I never really thought about this before. If, um that the wonderful instrument that the brain is it is translating all the information out there into electrical impulses now it actually mentioned a computer like noughts and ones went on a computer that that's sort of similar this neuroscience man which i thought was rather lovely um and then and he was taught and also the interesting fact that i well i thought anyway but that um, if we're talking about vibration, because now with that sense object with, and sense base, we're talking about what's arising, which we're going to move on to in a minute. We're sort of talking about vibration because in physics, we're talking about the sense of vibration and frequency, which is the number of times that the vibration occurs. And they measure vibration in terms of hertz so 20 hertz equals to 20 seconds so I'm sort of interested in this physics world as well because that's a pretty invisible world to me and I thought well this is rather interesting um just different the the, the kind of different world views on it and that if with hearing we work with vibration um with sight it's photons that are coming to us. Um, with the sense of smell and taste, it's molecules. And the sense of hearing need molecules to bounce off. So I hope you've got all this. You'll, you'll be tested on it afterwards. Um, but uh, I hope I don't, I'm just, uh, I, I got quite excited about all this. So I'll, uh, I, I'm, uh, I hope that <laughs> I've not left you behind. Go and have to just do that. <laughs> um, that it's not, that it, uh, <laughs> I can at least encourage your interest <laughs> with the way I'm working with it. Um, any rate, coming back to this page in front of us, now we're in Abhidharma world of sense of sound object. This is hearing, the sphere of hearing, the constituent element of hearing, the faculty of hearing. This, that is a world, a door, an ocean, lucent, that is pertaining to light, full of light, a field, a basis, the hither shore, an empty village. This is that form, which is the sphere of hearing. What on earth does that mean? And is that pertaining to something we might call nirvana, you know, and might want to lead us onwards? It's good stuff, isn't it? Right, let's go on to the next form. So what happens as a result of sense base and sense object? This uh, 
what, what is that form, which is the sphere of sound, that sound which is derived from the four great phenomena, the elements, is invisible, produces impact, such as the sound of drums, of tabors, of chank shells, of tom-toms, of singing, of music, clashing sounds, manual sounds, the noise of people, the sound of concussion of substances, of wind, of water, sounds human and other than human, or whatever other sound there is derived from the great phenomena, invisible and producing an impact, such a sound, invisible and producing impact as by the ear, invisible and reacting, one has heard, hears, will or may hear. Now, I just like that list and I think I've given myself a good reason to go out on my walks and thinking, listening to nightingales, which you got on the picture when there was advertised, hearing that as music. So I will move on. At the end of this book, because I'm taking right through the Dhamma Sangadi, so just uh, <laughs> hold on to your hats, I'm afraid. Uh, but now I'm taking you, I, want, I wanted to give you, as, offer a sense of an Abhidhamma perspective, because this is what I'm working with a science perspective, and then there's a neuroscience perspective. Now I'm going to, would like to introduce another perspective, which I'm really coming, just sort of having a sense of on my walks, and that is the world of these. The devas, the gods, which are the states? Now I'm going to take us, connect it with practice a bit more with the sphere. If the sphere is the world of the senses, if the rupa sphere is the world of the fine material sphere, our settling, and some of us may work with arupa sphere, the world of the formless. Uh, so, all and these are the devas relating to these worlds, which are the states that relate to the universe of sense. Take from the waveless deep of woe beneath up to the heaven above. Of the Parinimita were Sawati gods, I'll say that another time, inclusive. And then what are the ones that relate to the universe of form, the, the settling? Take from the Brahma world below up to the heaven above of the Akanita gods, inclusive. And the formless? Take from the entrance among the gods of the sphere of infinite space as the lower limit and up to the entrance above among the gods of the sphere where there is neither perception nor non-perception. There's a lot of gods there. All right. So I'm going to stop that share now. So that um, is so I'm, I'm what I'm working with now. The way I can work with it in a sort of 3D experiential, because I'm interested in how I can experience these things. Otherwise, you know, I'm just trying to. And I, I can only relate to them if I think of them as kind of worlds, worlds of meaning that I can step into. And the Buddha has quite a lot to say about stepping into worlds as well, doesn't he? Um, so. Um, so where where am I now? Let me just uh, just just to give you a sense of sound waves and hertz. Um, you've got just so, so you know what we're meaning for experientially when I mutter twenty hertz per second. Middle C, if you can hear it. Um, now I've done it is is what did I say that was 230 I think I said it's something like 230 the C down here is 32 and the one right at the top is 1007 1700 and something they're waves the amount that uh, they they uh, <coughs> um, they move they the, the frequency with which they move backwards and forwards um, yeah, actually, um, I can specify. So it's middle C is 262. I'll do that again. Bottom C is 32. And the highest one is, no, I got that wrong. Up there is 4,186. Number of times the sound waves move. So there we are. Um, <laughs> just what I thought was some interesting facts. I'm going to add a few related to that. Now, you can tell me I'm wrong, all you scientists out there, please do. Um, 
I then thought, oh, this is interesting. I still got still back back to physics. I'm this is, I'm afraid I'm a water sign. You just keep with me, stay with me. Um, back to physics. I'm now walking out there in the countryside. I'm thinking, this is all the things I can't hear as well as the things I can. And I began to, physics talks about infrasound and ultrasound, all right? So what does it say about infrasound and ultrasound? Well, in terms of objects I'm listening to, some of them have very deep um, density and very enormous volume, such as a volcano, and they have deep infrasound that we can't hear because the sound is so low. And the way they use to connect with those sounds, such as with whales communicating across oceans, is sonar. And that their resonator, if if we've all got our body of resonation, and our body is a resonator, I guess, in physics. And we all have implicitly um, in that body, in that density and volume that is our body, in sound, implicit sound, uh, and sound pressure that comes out when we speak, etc., or when a you hear a car going down the the road. Actually, what we're listening to is a very small element of what is possible. We know this, you know, when you see dogs talking to each other, birds talking to each other. What about the sounds we can't hear? Like, you know, these deep infrasounds, the whales, the way they communicate with them. At the other end, you've got ultrasound, which is so fine that as we know, it can penetrate the skin and give us pictures of babies. Well, I thought this was marvelous. Actually going on a walk and actually thinking to myself, this is what I'm hearing, but think of all the things those birds are hearing that I can't hear. Think of all those things that you know, that all these different worlds of sound, all those birds are living in their own world, communicating in their own world. And I'm more and more as I walk, I'm thinking in terms of worlds and the possibilities and actually almost allowing my ear just to be open. And it's a very interesting area I found that of trying to be conscious with the hearing actually almost going out to the edges of sound, which I've heard people talking, doing this in practice. I've been with the practice before Christmas once where somebody was doing this. Actually, it's interesting going to that edge of consciousness where you could go into fancifulness, being fanciful, but keeping with the real. It's very interesting sort of area. Uh, And as I was walking, for example, I was talking about the motorbikes, Uh, For example, I thought this changed. I found this actually changing my attitude to the motorbikes because, uh, oh, it was lovely and quiet when lockdown came along. And when they started to come back, it was kind of screeching through the environment like those planes that you get over the hillside. And uh, and then when I really listened to it, and I listened to another one, and I listened to a car, I thought, do you know, it's true this. They all have their own individual sort of sort of personality. I've got to be careful. That's getting fanciful. Um, and but and if it's true what this lady was saying about in the physics, then what I'm listening to is something about the maker of the motorbike, as well as the person, of course, who's driving it. When I thought about it like that, do you know, a weird thing happened. It just went straight to peace and strength and very ha- and happiness. I thought, oh, of course, he's how he loves it. He loves this sound. That he that. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm assuming it's a he. It might be a, lay, a she, but. He, this person loves this sound uh, just because I don't. That's my problem. Um, and that's another matter how I walk with it, which I'll talk about in a bit. But it just gave me a sense of how we listen to something and can have the ch- We can work with these ways in different perspectives completely if we choose to. So. Um, What I'd like to do now is involve you in doing a little exercise. I'd like to come back to Samar. All right. 
Um, I, I really like the, the nature of deep listening and our sort of Thich Nhat Hanh and deep listening in uh, mindfulness of the internal and the external. I'd like to now come back to those syllables of Samma, sense of evenness, natural, regular, calm, quiet. I'm saying them to remind us what they are. And I'm going to invite you to come on a little investigative journey of mentioning, of working with sounds, much in the way Paul has taught about us about sounds connected with the Yoga Vacha practice. Um, it seems very integral to, talk, to discussing this sound and music. Um, and I was wondering whether it would be quite interesting to investigate them by uh, repeating them. And I'd like to take you, if you are willing, on a little meditation, short five minute meditation. So if you're feeling comfortable, if you'd like to close your eyes, I will I will take you through. I'll give you offer some some um, instruction. So if you'd like to close the eyes. And uh, become aware of all the senses in turn and have a sense of remaining even and equanimous in, in the centre. And one of the things I noticed when I was walking, if I paid too much attention to hearing, everything else would go out of balance. It would almost, it's almost needed me to have the contact with the ground in order to really experience, to be able to be fully in balance. So just becoming aware very lightly uh, in whatever order you like, smell, taste, um, touch and uh, the sense of sight the sense of hearing as a sense base maybe do it like we did with the abhidhamma just having a sense of the door the doors of those senses not particularly engaging with them but not not engaging with them and then come back to that sense of touch so you feel balanced and <clears throat> centered equanimous in the middle I'm going to suggest that we work with Sama from unconscious. So I'd, I, I go to thought before it comes out of our minds, mouths. So I'm going to suggest that we now, and, and I'd like you to, as you do this, um, become aware of the process of hearing, when hearing becomes listening or vice versa, hearing, listening, and knowing or understanding. And just investigating those. So allow the, the, the thought, satma, sama, to come into gradually, gradually into consciousness until it moves up into uh, the realm of uh, labeling or connected with the heart, labeling, if that's possible, <laughs> until conscious thinking about that's what I mean. keeping all the senses balanced, <clears throat> does knowledge have to be heard before it becomes part of our being or is it innate? Is it connected with sense of touch, for example? So as it's now in the mind, gradually allow the mouths to sound the syllables with voiceless, first of all, so without the sound. So allow ourselves to explore whether this is our meditation practice. If it is connects, see, is it connected with the word samatha is my question, really. Sama, sama. Can we allow it ourselves to voice it and gradually allow it voiceless and I gradually allow the voice to come to it and utter the sound, satma, and play with it. Play with it in sound. And now let it die away. And I'd like to read something about me and Michello. Trying to deep listen to my body, my mind and cello. Hello, my cello old friend, whom I've known since I was 13. I greet you like this every time I get you out of your case. Present from my parents, actually, whose photo I keep on the shelf, sending them silent thanks every time I play. 
Upon retirement and first time playing after 25 years, cello teacher said to me, you're sitting like you were your 13-year-old you. Who needs psychology? Unpick my body. Cellos have a lifespan just like us, albeit probably a bit longer. <laughs> uh, they can get to be past their best too, though the best ones get better. Uh, note to self, encouragement to play well as cello will sound better. The wood changes as it is affected by the vibrations, the resonance. It's a resonator. Cello is a resonator. Like all objects, it produces its own sound pressure waves, pushing out and making sound. Sound comes from there, but through me. I am the resonator too. It's all down to me. Listen. Listen, it's all about deep listening. In the Sona Sutta, tuning the mind is like tuning an instrument. How to do that? On the cello, we tune to concept pitch A using a tuning fork. You can't hear it, but here's a tuning fork. Hearing true A is interesting. The human body knows when you get there. Body resonates. Instrument tells you too as it resonates. And there was a TED talk uh, giving advice to her audience on how to listen in her concerts. Evelyn Glennie says, let your body be the resonator. Let it tell you whether it likes the music. The response can arise anywhere in the body. Back to A string. Once you find A, you can play up the string and find increasingly higher harmonics related to that note. This is a reminder of Pythagoras' principle, cause that the shorter the length of string, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the note. Through the law of natural ratio, you can also hear up the length of that string. This is Pythagoras' law of perfect fifths. It's what we call an interval in music, and it's happy and positive. It's this. Lavender's blue dilly dilly, for those of you who remember that. <laughs> uh, part of the thought at the time was that the heaven or celestial spheres in nature worked in harmony together through music, a reflection of worlds at different levels, correspondences. And musicology is very interesting, all sorts of laws of seven, which I'm not going into now. How do I support mentally my playing? What's tuning the mind like to enable beautiful playing? Maybe it's finding the right mental state, i.e. connecting with meta. And also, Sila, you can't be angry when you're trying to play an instrument. Connecting with the pitch, working out the key I'm in and general feel of the piece. Is it happy, melancholy, thoughtful? Looking at the time signature, that tells me that tells me the overall mood. Maybe it's a dance. Maybe it's reflective. Maybe that's choosing the right length of the breath to start me off. What's the theme of my practice? Climbing up and down the scale appropriate to the piece I'm about to practice, then working with the melody. Could this be like developing the taka and bichara, applying and sustaining the attention? Contact with the seat, base of spine, start balanced, relaxed and even minded, even breath. Press fingers of left hand firmly on string, on spongy part of finger without holding tension. Be aware of firm, precise point of contact, ready to move in any direction. Elbow, shoulder, body, ready to respond. Hold the bow as though it has offered itself to me to be held. No tension. Yet with relaxed tension so I don't drop it. Muscles relaxing downward, aware of feet on the ground, point of contact of bow with string is everything. Point of sound resonance, focus, even balance, even balance of mindfulness and concentration, a kagata, one-pointedness, being mode, then glide into doing mode, right effort, Tempo, pulse, regular, even, maybe fast, maybe slow, appropriate to what's needed of the piece. Pause, then summer, quiet, calm, even. Try to hear the pulse before starting to play again. The world is contained in that first touching. Play the note 
by lovingly stroking the string as though you were diving into a clear pool of water, creating a curving arc that goes under, not over. Are all the hairs of the bow completely engaging with the string? You'll hear it in the sound. Anatta, non-self, will echo through. Now smooth change from down bow to up bow, gliding, out breath, then in breath again, move strings, move fingers, arrive together to land on the note cleanly and exactly, beautifully. Present moment, calm approach. If I'm calm, I'll play from equanimity. I'd like to share a sound with you. In those early days of early radio, there was probably just as much invention as there is today. Who but a genius or a nut could have induced Beatrice Harrison to sit in the middle of a Surrey wood playing songs my mother taught me on the cello to induce the nightingales to sing? brings me to I hope I've the con yeah communication it's all music isn't it <laughs> so what I'd like to just um there's something else I want to show you and I'd like to lead us up to that now and that will conclude my talk um when walking now working with that uh, beautiful little recording there, which some of you may have come across before. A general approach to how we go walking. I know you all know this, and I'm repeating, so just forgive if it's um, repetition. Um, you know, in his book, for example, Tanisha Bhikkhu was, Bhikkhu was taking the five faculties. For me, I relate very much to the four foundations of mindfulness, which is, and of course, and it is a, a cure-all in my experience. It, it sorts out everything and it covers everything. Um, so for me, it's mindfulness of body, a reminder of what that is, mindfulness of feeling, mind, and dhammas. Um, so creating a contact with the footsteps as we walk and actually listening to the sound the footsteps create, maybe just taking a slightly different angle on it. Working, working with mindfulness of pleasant and unpleasant is actually using the word harmonious and um, dissonant might be quite interesting. Uh, I'm just a couple of short clips of what the way um, Tanisri Bhikkhu uh, translate this which is rather lovely he's talking to Rahula his son and he says Rahula develop meditation in tune with earth for when you are developing meditation in tune with earth agreeable and disagreeable sensory impressions that have arisen will not stay in charge of your mind just as when people throw what is clean or unclean on on the earth uh, feces, urine, saliva, pus or blood. The earth is not horrified, humiliated or disgusted by it. In the same way, when you are developing meditation in tune with earth, agreeable and disagreeable sensory impressions that have arisen will not stay in charge of your mind. And then he says the same, develop meditation in tune with water, uh, develop as, just as when people wash what is clean or unclean in water, uh, the water is not horrified. He says, develop meditation in tune with fire, just as when fire burns, what is clean or unclean, it is not horrified, humiliated or disgusted by it. De develop meditation in tune with wind, 
For just as when wind blows what is clean or unclean, it is not horrified or humiliated by it or disgusted. Develop meditation in tune with space. Just as space is not established anywhere in the same way when you are developing meditation in tune with space, these disagreeable, disagreeable sensory impressions that have arisen will not stay in charge of your mind. This working with mindfulness of feeling, a short extract clip from what he translates, another ex- thing he said, when the faculties are fully developed. So this is the Buddha talking about um, the unsurpassed excellence of fully developed faculties of an, of an awakened one. And how, Ananda, in the discipline of a noble one, is there the unexcelled development of the faculties? He discerns um, he discerns that when hearing a sound with the ear, there arises in a monk what is agreeable, what is disagreeable, what is agreeable and disagreeable. He discerns that this agreeable thing has arisen in me, this disagreeable thing has arisen in me, this agreeable and disagreeable thing has arisen in me. And that is compounded, gross, dependently co-arisen. But this, this is peaceful, i.e. that is to say equanimity. With that, the arisen, disagreeable and disagreeable, agreeable and disagreeable thing ceases and equanimity it takes its stance just as a strong man might easily snap his fingers that is how quickly equanimity takes its stance in the discipline of a noble one this is called the unexcelled development of the faculties with regard to sounds cognizable by the ear and I thought it was really interesting because in a lot of the chants we've got snapping a finger finger snap and the elbow, there's the elbow one as well. And it says something about worlds, how we can move just like that from one world to another. And that says something about working with these worlds when we go on walks and, uh, you know, how we can move very, very quickly, as we know, from one world to another. Um, so that brings me um, to one last thing I'd like to offer in terms of a, a little something to listen to. Uh, this is a, a little soundscape that to some of you, I, you have heard me inflict one of these on you before, but a lockdown habit I developed uh, was uh, for those involved in the theatre world or the music world, they will know of a software feature called Audacity. It's basically a mini sound recording studio. And it, I found I could have great fun with it. And so what I would like to offer by way of leaving this morning is a little soundscape that I hope I can show up here and uh, produce uh, to and if I, I hope uh, I manage to sputter it all out in some kind of salient order if it's offered any I'm sure you're doing all this sort of thing but if it's offered any kind of inspiration to anybody if you like cooking you know you want to follow your nose you know I don't know just if then trust it I think that's what I'd like to say to finish to trust your instinct within practice find yourself a lovely set of frames of reference within your Buddhist experience your experience of what works for you in Buddhism and trust it because it's a beautiful thing if we let it so with that I'd like to finish with this it's sort of visual and sort of uh, there is a visual aspect to it, which I should like, which I can share. And then there will be sound that goes with it. It lasts about seven or eight minutes. Yeah, move you along there. Can you see that? OK, so it's that's what it looks like, the visual on the soundscape. OK, and I warn you, cello is kind of heart of this again. Just to let you know and warn you, don't have high expectations. What you're about to hear is not is uh, not necessarily is not me. Uh, there are I'm, I've got bits of me on there. Um, certainly, this was inspired by walks in in Bakewell and certain and things things like this. Sort of there was a swan and her baby. I've been watching kind of all year. His his feathers turning white. So here we go. Yeah, let me start again and...
There we are. Make sure we're at the beginning.
dit « Tu ne te permets pas d'émettre un son tel un gond brisé, tu as atteint le Nibbana. » Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rosie. Did anybody uh, attain it, by the way, during that? No, it would be nice. <laughs> well, just a question. <laughs> um, well, I would say, from my hearing is one of my um, my sensitive sense, I suppose, and music particularly is uh, as as a quite a strong power to transport me to other worlds. So I. Uh, I really identified with 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 that piece, um, and also everything that you said. It was, for me, it was a very very powerful thing, and I know that other people react to different things in different ways. Um, but certainly, hearing, I, uh, I, I understand what you're talking about. For some people, it's it's art, it's visual phenomena, but but he, auditory phenomena for me. Um, take me somewhere else, and even within that that piece, I could feel um, the arising and the falling away, and the pleasant and the unpleasant, and and all of those things. Um, before I open it up for questions, because I am dominating this now, um, it was how do you feel about? Um, Where does the where does the indulging and the delight become a problem in practice, as it were? How do you draw the line between I think experiencing the worlds and remaining detached? By using a frame of reference, by using the four for me the four foundations of mindfulness, because. You know, for a monk, they can't listen to music because, you know, it's dance and song. But uh, it's noticing, uh, particularly at the level of feeling, when feeling becomes attachment and goes to excitement. All right. And but in working with it with Samatha is slightly interesting because actually we can have that. But if you trust in something like the four foundations of mindfulness my experience has been but you have to be slightly mindful with it um that it will naturally flow over into a higher feeling which is what we're all about with what we do with our meditation practice and the way to do that that i try to get over this morning is allowing your body to be a resonator evelyn glenny was completely clear about it and of course children do these things but she was she, lovely ted talk she said allow your body to tell you what you're feeling get this thinking thing out of the way and actually listen to it and if your children you know they get on the floor and they tap the what the floor or you know you it may be an unexpected part of your body it may be your ear that's or an eyelash an eyelash that's fluttering or your big toe that's pulsating you know um I've learned to be exploratory about how I experience these things but I my view is if you really keep mindfulness of body it won't let you down it will take you and you're trusting your own innate sense of mindfulness of feeling to work with your mind to bring harmony in the sense of the practice. And then, you know, there's a natural discernment. Now, in terms of the practice, it goes into discernment is anicca, dukkha, ananatha, learning that's and letting go of it. Now, I am think I'm talking about finding equanimity. I think I, that's what I'm actually saying. From equanimity, if we get really versed at that, then we can start looking at these things with a measure of insight and trying to investigate them. In the sort of the way I was talking about with regard to the motorbike and that sort of thing, you know, uh, actually, and I think all my attempts at neuroscience and science is attempts at investigation, really, and trying to develop that. And so trusting your judgment and what, what for you is a way of working with it that's mindful. I don't know whether that answers your question. 
<laughs> whether it helps or not really. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, mind, mindfulness is key. Um, yeah, you have uh, to be you have to be willing to do it though. And if it's it, an indulgence is is an interesting thing because you have to be willing to uh, let yourself see the other side of indulgence as well. I think it's in you know wish to do as well. It's developing that really as well, perhaps as well. <laughs> Or actually trusting yourself that there is another side to the music that you're listening to, that you're not hearing the whole story about the music, you know, one aspect to it. But maybe that wasn't the whole aspect of what the composer, and think about it in terms of what was the composer trying to portray? And in the way that we're talking about with motorbikes, you know, it's sort of, it's notes on a page and what you're hearing is three or four times removed. I mean, rock band or whatever, or from... The original, that's that there's a, the person who originally wrote it, the original inspiration, the mouthpiece through which it's coming is interpretation. You've, you've heard it interpreted already by a few times. So <laughs> actually interesting thinking about in terms of coming back, going back to source, really, <laughs> I found. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to open it up to um, the group for any discussion? Yes, I've been uh, wanting to know the explanation for a long time about what is the sound which I particularly hear all the time inside, what I call as the sound of silence. I try to find out the explanations for that and, uh, and I do read that it can be used as a background sound also during the meditation practice. I just wonder how do you explain that sound, please? Um, I mean, sound can be used, you're right. We can take any object as an object for meditating with um, the sound may be connected with the end, right at the end of the piece, when the soundscape came, came to an end for Santa, it may be your inner knowing. And, and the, the reading about, uh, with the Buddha gives about the five, develop five faculties and connected with space. Space is the setting for all of these things. Uh, it may be that there's an internal uh, knowing inside of you that's quite at peace and that my that that actually all sign sound emanates from that place of silence and it may be that a, a deep knowing in you that's not quite yet conscious for example um and that maybe all i would say can think is to test it against your own experience of working with it in practice uh, and just sort of seeing what resonates? Use your body as a resonator, you know, and let your body tell you what it knows about it would be what I would say. I would suggest to you the centre as a way of working. Uh, just allow your but go to deep, you know, like sort of take that harm, deep listening, deep mindfulness of body, you know, deep mindfulness of uh, getting contact with your deep, your what your body knows about it. And it might surprise you. <laughs> I can't say myself what it is, that's your own experience, but, you know, it may be all these different ways of practice and everything else you've been doing over the years, however you've been doing it, has given you a deep understanding about the nature of things, you know, to trust it and to trust your own nature to know how to work with it as well. I'm also surprised. Um... A child, a few months old child in the court, standing yeah. in the middle of the night and asking the question, what is the sound, Grandma, that I hear? Oh. Child, how do you explain? I know, in the court. Yeah, you know, you're talking to somebody who... I really relate to notions of Davis, and, and I'm going to tell you, Vasanta, and I'm sorry if some of you have heard this, but it actually remark goes, takes me straight to an incident in hospital, because some of you know I had an emergency op a year ago, and when I was in the recovery room, and um, you know, I was quite, I was seriously ill for a while, and um, when I was in recovery room, 
there was a point at which I knew not many people knew I'd been poorly and um I, one or two people did. And I, there was a point at which I was in, I was getting better. I cannot not get well because I know somebody's chanting for me. I know that I felt like there was an experience of, I um, you know, this is fanciful, but it's a kind of, I think it's my fine material fanciful moment uh, of a sort of Dave is almost knitting my brow together to to uh, and I could feel that they were around through this chanting that had been done. You know, I you're talking, you know, to somebody who has tendencies to fancifulness, but I I'm convinced when children are little, you know, my daughter had an invisible friend. I think our children they're in they they um, they have beautiful contacts that we may know nothing about. <laughs> And they will perhaps pass away nicely as they grow up. They'll maybe forget about them and all the rest of it. But I can't help you any more than that, Cassandra, about that one. So I have a tendency to fancifulness, so I have to keep real. But I think this is real as well. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Rosie. What, what, a, what a morning. Very unusual to explore sound, you know, rather than visuals. And, uh, um, and what you said, Noel, as well earlier, that... Uh, that stirred some things up. <laughs> but um, uh, what came to mind was uh, as well, um, you, you mentioned earlier, I mean, I find it magic that uh, you, you take a string, pluck it uh, like a guitar string or musical string, and then exactly halfway, you pluck the half size and you get the octave above and it, and it sounds beautiful, the harmony, yet, it's this very simple number ratio, you know, I mean, why? I, I do never cease to wonder about that. And um, and it was at school, at school when we were learning about sound that um, uh, a physics teacher actually lent me a book called Science and Music. And um, uh, alas, he died recently and it was his funeral only uh, a week uh, ago. Um, and um, I, I just feel his spirit is hovering in the background. <laughs> uh, oh, great. To, you know, with talk. And, and also connected with school was um, there's memory. We, we, we did um, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, who wrote a book called Point Counterpoint. It's like a, which, which I went on to read. And it's like a book of ideas, uh, a novel of ideas in quotes. And um, uh, I know some years ago in summer in the Summer Association, there's a call for like um, uh, pre summer summer experiences, and one was reading a passage in this book, point counterpoint, and it came back to me. And um, if I may, um, uh, thanks to the miracle of the internet, on wiki quotes, there's actually. The, the few sentences, which I'd just like to read, if you don't mind, uh, which had this, produced this summer moment mm -hmm. in me. And just to set the scene, uh, the, there's a chapter in the book which is taking place at the country mansion of Lord and Lady Edwards. And Lady Edwards is entertaining in the dining room or in the hall, uh, some musicians, including a virtuoso uh, violinist called Pongiglione and Lord Edward is up in his private laboratory with his um, laboratory assistant. He, he's, they're wealthy enough to have a private laboratory assistant doing experiments on, on uh, the nervous system of newts and they, they, they're discussing about this. And um, anyway, it then says, uh, that Lord, so Lord, and Lay, uh, Lord Edwards is in this laboratory and uh, he's been chatting with a laboratory assistant and, and he, he hears something in the distance across the courtyard and here it goes uh, Pongilione is bowing and scraping of the anonymous fiddlers had shaken the air in the great hall had set the glass of the windows looking onto it vibrating and thus in turn had shaken the air in Lord Edward's apartment on the further side the shaking air rattled Lord Edward's eardrum, 
the interlot, malleus, incus, and stirrup oh. bones were set in motion so as to agitate the membrane of the eardrum and raise an infinitesimal storm in the fluid of the cochlea. The hairy endings of the auditory nerves shuddered like weeds in a rough sea. A vast number of obscure miracles were performed in the brain. And Lord Douglas <laughs> ecstatically whispered, Oh! <laughs> and, uh, and I, uh, I, I remember it was, uh, God, it was 50 odd years ago. Uh, I, and I, I, my, 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 I, I just went, bloody hell fire. And I put the book down and I, and I took a breath, composed myself and uh, read it again. <laughs> So it was an introduction to Samata for you. You had a Samata yeah, yeah, I can see that. But also I think, you know, was that a Vipassana moment when... Yes, exactly. You know, bark. And, um, and, and it just alerted me to the way that, that one can do magic with words as well, you know, and, uh, and set things in train in that way, you know. I was going to see if I could just play the harmonic. Um, I don't know whether you can hear it, but yeah. well, I can't play it. I've got no room, but. Okay. I'm trying to find the E as well. It goes up in fifths as well, so very, very bad, poorly played, but to give you an idea of what we're talking about with the harmonics. So, yeah, great. What a lovely, lovely, that's <laughs> very funny. At least I got some of the words right. Anyway, I'm delighted to hear. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much, Rosie. Enjoyed that. And I'm um, sorry, I'm trying to lower my hand. Um, it's Yeah, it was uh, very enjoyable for me because, as you know, you know, I, I love music as well. Um, so it was very uh, enjoyable. And I love the cello, which I found, I find different instruments relate to sort of different chakras, if you like. Um, I always find the cello a very moving instrument somehow. And music can be wonderful for changing states, for lifting you out maybe of, of one state into another, you know, so it can be very powerful. Um, and thanks, of course, for the reading as well, which was uh, really enjoyable and, you know, very relevant. The diagram of the ear was fascinating. Um, the co cochlea, the, the sort of conch shell type things, is beautiful. You know, it's such a powerful image. Um, the other things I just wanted came to mind were you talking, Rosie, about your... Um, experience in the recovery room well years ago I don't think it's fanciful I mean yeah, I think we're very we can be very to use a musical expression tuned in you know we're all all about frequencies we're all in different frequencies and different spiritual levels all the time um, and when I came back from Australia I had a back operation in 2003 and I remember I'd been part of a women's group um, we called the crones group sort of wise women's group in Australia. We used to do singing and all sorts of things together and healing and in the recovery room, the crones were there and they were really, really powerful healing me. One, one was very much to the forefront, a lovely woman. Um, and they had their hands around my back. And it was an incredibly powerful experience and it's very real to me, you know, I don't think, um, because they knew I was having the operation and they said that they would send to healing. So, yeah, we're surrounded by frequencies and devas and all sorts of beautiful angelic beings. And the other thing I just wanted to mention was um, the lady, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, the lady who, who spoke first about the, the baby in the cot. What came to mind for me was past lives, past life experiences. And um, children apparently often remember their past lives. And usually by the time they're seven, any traces have gone. So they're in school and 
people talk about them being imaginary friends or of imagination, but very often it's it's past life memories and past life experiences. So maybe that child was um, you know, a musician or something in immediate past life. Um, so that's, yeah, that's all I wanted to say, really. But thanks again, Rosie. Thank you. All right, in the soundscape, um, I mean, there's a lot to, uh, to do with musicology that you could explore as well. And, of course, there's solfeggio. And one of the uh, systems in medieval times was the do re mi fa sol system that relates, actually goes back to medieval times and sort of hermetic ways of working. And they are related to Hertz, which is why I was talking about them. And what you heard on the soundscape were two different levels of Hertz. There were two things going on there because they, you know, you can download apps, sound apps, where they're called solfeggio and where you, you can download them and you can just play one at night when you're going to sleep. And it's they're on a vibrational level, which, uh, which work with all the different chak chakras, with the different levels of the chakras so I sort of try to to sort of get a sense of 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 that really in there as well the other thing was the the actually the tone the note a lot of that that um the the the, the melody was this sort of g you know in, in old in ancient indian systems you know they the ragas they have morning time afternoon time evening time and they've never crossed and i in my book it's got actually gave me a hint as to what the notes were so you had a morning time note of g uh, largely quite a lot that went through that which is quite good for morning energy and just sort of seeing us on our way so yeah but thank you diana thank you for that Hello, Ji Young. I've noticed every time you've been up there that that beautiful thing in the corner at the back. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> Are you a player, Ji Young? Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Rose. <laughs> I can relate to so much, and uh, uh, yeah, my own journey um, learning cello uh, as a grown-up. I, I can relate relate so much, and also. Um, you know, uh, I find it is really, um, yeah, just the learning or playing cello is something so much to do with um, uh, meditation practice. But I will never be able to put that into words. I'm so glad that you you made that connection um, and actually you can actually say in words so we can all share. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm really glad. Wow. I, 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 yeah, I appreciate so much. And probably I, I can talk to you for, <laughs> I don't know, many days about it. Um, well, we'll have to get together, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. When lockdown comes down, we'll have to duet or something. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and also, yeah, I wish I could, I could listen to you in person. That would be... That would be right. Don't worry. Great. It's, not that, it's not that great. You know. <laughs> yeah, well... Somehow, when Richard arranged his concerts, I decided to. I was preparing for an exam. In my old age, I've been doing exams. So. <laughs> really, I think the principle of you can take any hobby or any interest and work with it. I think that's the point I was trying to make, really, that, you know, whatever the instrument is or whatever the way of working is, there's a way of working with this. Because if you take if you take the truth of what Tanisa Obiku is talking about, you know, the five faculties, the four, they're a universal, the four foundations of mindfulness, they're universal. So you can, we, we, we can all, we all have that within us, Stephanie. So thank you. I think. Mm -hmm. Thank Thanks you. a lot. <laughs> That's <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I wondered where is it? G. Where is she living? Where is she? Is in. Is it Wilmslow? You're in. G. Um, I mean, he tomorrow now. <laughs> oh, are you? Oh, right. Not in some far flung place in the world. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rosie. I just love the soundscape. I wanted to say it really affected me. I suppose that in a way building up to it, it was very moving and very, it was like to me an installation somehow and very creative. Um, and I thought of the value of doing that with a with our background, I suppose, in, in meditation practice. So that, that was really wonderful and quite powerful. And it's got a few points. I remember as a child myself, I used to think, I heard sound. 
I was a bit frightened by it from the scientists said it before. And I, I, it came back to me. Maybe, I actually thought it might be something inside my ear that was uh, mm. rustling. Uh, but I do remember it and being a bit disturbed by that. And, and I put it down to something physiological, but I remember it. Um, and what I wanted to say was that what you gave, what you reminded me of was the, the miracle of sound, like we've mentioned before, and causes. It, it just describes it, and it is that sort of sense of, wow, what lucky people we are, you know, to have this. And when you said about the birds can communicate um, so dogs and birds can have hear sounds that we don't hear. Mm -hmm. So they have a whole world of sound. And, and it just made me think that perhaps through meditation practice, and particularly we are aware sometimes when you do a lot of practice on retreat, you can hear what you didn't hear before or you notice detail. And it's like your senses really open up. And, and why not then uh, in those moments that you and Diana mentioned that you, we actually just, the capacity to open up to more, whatever it is, but the capacity is there and, and it may not be fanciful. It might just be, in a sense, a possibility. And maybe, you know, when you read the texts and <laughs> the divine ear and the divine eye, it all kind of fits in a way, you know, as a result of some kind of development. So it's the capacity that increases, certainly. And I just wanted to say about deep listening, I was interested in what that is, partly because this week there was a special radio program called Sisters in Transistors. <laughs> And it's about an electronic music from De Delia Derbyshire, who, who did the Doctor Who music, if you remember that. And they've been celebrating this. And there was a whole program about, well, women in technology, but particularly how skilled they were in using electronic music, just like you did. Um, and one of the commentators said it brought her to the... Uh, what she called active listening. I've heard of that before, but deep and active listening. It changed her life in a way, becoming an electronic musician because of the, the way she had to listen and what she could hear. So I'm really curious now to follow that up a bit more, active listening, deep listening. I'm sure there's something you know to be developed there. And our practice might be a way to it. So, so you've opened up that gateway, Rosie. <laughs> So, so thank you. Um, it was very, very wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say a few things. First of all, that was so, um, so amazing. You've, you've brought, you brought up so much for us to think about. Um, but one of the things that um, I'm really interested in and that, uh, it is the way um, sound affects the body. Because when we were listening to the um, the sound, the, the last bit that you did, um, I, I realise, and I, I've often realised this, especially when I've been to live concerts, that it's almost as though I listen with my body. And I felt it very strongly when you were playing that soundscape, that um, it, it kind of goes directly in somehow. And I... I have no idea how that happens from here to here. It, it just doesn't seem to, I, I don't understand it at all and I don't expect uh, that, that you might either. But <clears throat> I mean, when you think about how sound, um, unpleasant sound can have quite an effect on the body, you know, it can jump or um, feel tense because the sound is unpleasant and loud, all those things that uh, sounds that can affect the body in the way uh, it does. But also listening to the soundscape today uh, and, and feeling this sort of immediacy uh, of the sound into the body. Um, the, the, I, the thought came to me that there was something it, almost archaic about it. There was something about the, the way the body responds to sound that seems to um, go back in time. And listening to your explanation of the devas, 
was quite helpful really because in a way I can see that that's probably what I was feeling that there is um, there are dimensions about it that are um, beyond our knowing but that it is probably something to do with uh, the Deva realms. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. No, thank you. That's really interesting, Marjorie, about going going back um, to something almost primordial, uh, because that, that I think that what that brings up for me is there's something very interesting about it being the last sense to go at death yes. mm. and it is sort of it relates to that because it's it's there in the background all the time um and i know what it, I, yeah I sort of i got cut off just at the, at the end of Veronica's, but you mentioned the Davis. That's kind of what I wanted to try and get over this morning was that sense of possibility. I think you've just used the word possibility too, or Veronica did, I can't remember. But when you go for a walk or just being open is all we can do, really, is what the point I was trying to make. And actually what came to mind with Jataka's stories, you know, you think of Indra, and that sort of, he was always, he was a scallywag, wasn't he? He used to dress up in disguise and and come and meet individuals. And he was always, uh, you know, come meeting the Buddha or whatever. I can't remember details of any particular stories. But, um, you know, you never know that possibility of when you're in touch with something. And you have to go to a different sense of self within you, a different sense of senses within you that's that's fine material or something. Um, but what I just wanted to get over is the sense that I don't, I work in, working with faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom, you have to trust at some level that there is something in us that is in touch with that. That's why we're practicing and we're keeping on coming back to it and doing it. We can do it and we are engaged in it actively in the medical cushion, but maybe we can support ourselves doing it in daily life. And the thing about um, with uh, Dukkha, um, because it is, there are sounds that come to us. I didn't particularly go into that this morning, except to talk about it in terms of maybe hearing it less as pleasant or unpleasant, more as exploring it with as being harmonious or dissonant and seeing if that helps and noticing. I was re recalling Rachel's talk. For her, she was talking about taking it to compassion, I think, if I understood her correctly, that you can, one can do that when there's enough, if there's enough sound there that is upsetting, you can work with it from the point of view of taking it to compassion or you can work with it from the point of view like I was trying to describe of the motorbike of actually trying to see a larger perspective and which might mean engaging with it from the other way around um, and that was you know that was one thing my cherry teacher would say to me that I always found very curious she sort of, she would say to me hold your bow now let your hand listen <laughs> I'm not suggesting we do this all the time, but actually let your hand listen. Let your finger sort of taste the note. No. I think, what's she going on about? But actually it opens up your senses. And I think that's really very interesting. You know, and I say to it now, I don't precisely know how he teaches it, but it seems to me to move around in, we're moving around in something like that area. And if nothing else, maybe I'm, I know I'm not always the greatest friend, maybe I can be a better listener and hope if nothing else, wish to be a better listener to people, you know, a bit of better friend sort of thing, that sort of thing, you know. So, so, uh, yes, thank you, Marjorie. I don't know whether I've answered anything of what you said there, but <laughs> it's very interesting what you said. <laughs> uh, just one thing, uh, Rosie. What is the name of the book that uh, Tanasura Biko wrote? The Wings to Awakening. It is online. It's, if you go to what's oh, yeah. the website, the uh, it is it is it, it's a great, very good read. It's you have to stay with it. He's quite unusual, very unusual in the way he works with Bodhi Pakidamas. But you know, and it is it's an in, he's an interesting read the way he translates things. So definitely. 
great talk. I studied music technology. I think the middle age, 440 years. Yep. I don't know about the, whether it's the C or the A. Yep. That's a contradictor. No, uh, no, that's fine. The middle, the A is 440 hertz. Yes, you're quite right. So, well, actually, that's interesting because um, when I, you're right, of course, and that's the A just below the middle C, but, um, and what I was quoting was middle C, so that wasn't right. You're quite right. I think what they were doing was taking it from the lower C, and I've only got a keyboard, which doesn't do the whole work. So, thank you for correcting me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I particularly liked your work uh, referring to the physical elements of meditation like earth and air and water. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what you were listening to in the soundscape at the end was was those really? They were they were radio waves, but they were radio waves from NASA. Uh, they were they're not. They were one of them was sounds of the Earth. So that was all us. We were you were listening to. Then we went to Jupiter, and. Uh, they have waves there, apparently. They're plasma waves. And I thought, what on earth are plasma waves? And the best I could come up with was the green stuff in Ghostbusters. But that's, I couldn't get any for near to it. So you actually, you were listening to elements as you were. And also, the after the birds were singing, there's, there was, it was an Aeolian harp, which yeah. I, I loved. I'd loved I went to a museum of Aeolian harps on the top of a mountain in Austria once. And it, it's wonderful. You know, the, island, the wind interacts with these wonderful tubular things, and they do it in different ways. Oh, the cello piece. The oh, no, that wasn't me. That was your ear mark. <laughs> Catherine stopped. Uh, these things, I hasten to add, if any of this is actually getting going down oh, for posterity, that all these sounds I found were freely available. I had to make sure they were all non, non copyright. And uh, this seemed, this oh, is free. Oh, oh, the Swan is by Sanson, and it's uh, the Swan. And I bought, I could only go to that because I'd just been watching the Swan knocking around the River Wye in Bakewell just uh, over a year, watching him grow up. So that was the Swan. And you heard me playing around with harmonics because uh, when we got to outer space, because I wanted to kind of show what we've just been talking about, which is the relationship of the real, the, in the sense of the known, what I can do on a cello, with what is unknown to me, what's going on out in Jupiter, so I, and, and, and out in outer space. So, uh, it, so you heard me mucking around with harmonics uh, right in there. I wanted to show sort of correspondences, really. That was my attempt at it, anyway, so... <laughs> So back to you, Rosie and Noel, for the ending, the finale. <laughs> I don't. Well, I don't think. I think yeah, there's only one ending I can think of. Um, well, first of all, to thank you very much, all of you. For I do appreciate it. You didn't have to. We're we're out of lockdown. You could have. Uh, so may it inspire you on your afternoon walk. That uh, may you enjoy your exercise. Enjoy listening to each other. May may we all listen to each other better. Is perhaps my wish. And that uh, maybe for me. And if. Noel, who was in charge, could have their finger on the end meeting for all. I would like us uh, in in that uh, tune, tuning, tuning to the earth. That Rahula, want to Rahula, uh, tune yourself to the earth, tune um, the wind, um, uh, and then there was a little explanation afterwards about. Um, if you really, when the, the, the faculties are finely tuned, you can move from one world to another. I'm inviting us to move from this world to our other worlds with a finger snap. So I would like us, encourage us all. And when we, we all finger snap together and we'll take the mute off, we'll all finger snap together at the same time. And I would invite you all to deep, to do, use it with, deep listening, and to listen to it as harmonious music. Music that's 
offered to us in the spirit that the Buddha has offered us the teaching that we could, we go straight from one world to another and I might know just to end meeting for all just like that so let's snap and then end meeting for all may you be well and happy everybody have a lovely day bye 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 <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.